Welcome to the dark stream. I'm Vox Day, voxday.blogspot.com, and Infogalactic News. Um, we're going a little early today, going actually quite early today, because I've got some stuff going on tonight that will uh, prevent me from being able to uh, to do a dark stream later. So, anyhow, what what let them bake cake is a reference to is of course it's a callback to the the mythical statement by Marie Antoinette about the um, about the peasants and the, the common people she said when they, they didn't have any bread to eat she supposedly said let them eat cake well it's actually kind of an appropriate analogy here because what we've been seeing in the news recently is the um, both the Muslims and the Jews in Europe are, th are trying to pitch a big hissy fit over the fact that the largest province in Belgium, um, pretty much the, the Flemish-speaking area, uh, just unanimously passed a law to require that animals that are being butchered be stunned first. Now this is a, a, a common and humane practice because you know, even those of us who are big-time meat eaters don't want the animals to suffer. You know, there's no reason for it. But, uh, according to Muslims, this is, is not halal. According to Jews, this is not kosher. And, of course, you know, um, from the usual suspects, we've got the, it's another holocaust sort of thing. Um, one of the... One of the, one of the um, Jewish leaders even said that it is the uh, worst uh, anti-Jewish act in Europe since the, uh, National Socialism. You know? um, <laughs> and, and people wonder why we don't take the Jews seriously. Um, anyhow, the, um, the thing is, is that um, there's no such thing as religious freedom anymore. Okay? The, as we found, not only in the USA, but now in Britain, um, they are attempting to force Christian bakers to bake cakes for gay weddings and things like that. It's absolutely, it's, you know, it's absolutely ludicrous. And so here's the thing. They do not recognize religious freedom for Christians, so we do not recognize religious freedom for Muslims, Jews, Aztecs, or anywhere else. For, furthermore, religious freedom is fundamentally a white European Christian tradition. The origins of religious freedom did not actually include Muslims, did not include the Jews, did not include the Hindus, did not include the Aztecs, etc. It was basically an idea to prevent different Christian denominations from killing each other. That's what religious freedom, in its original and true sense, actually means. And that is, of course, why the concept of religious freedom has entirely failed with regards to expanding the concept to include other religions. So, now, the, there's also the concept, like Sarcasticus just mentioned, that under the Western tradition, um, People have, a, a private individual has the right to deny service to anyone. So, of course, uh, the lawyers and the courts have all decided that these various, these various concepts, um, you know, they, they basically redefine a private institution as a public one, and then therefore hold it accountable. I mean, this is the same game they play all the freaking time. The redefinition is, you know, the, the SJW... Uh, redefinition game is not a new one. The atheist bait-and-switch game is not a new one. This game has gone on for a long, long time. And so, but what we're seeing here is that this is how their tactics can be used against them. So, if you want to get rid of these people, then you start passing laws making it difficult for them to practice whatever it is that they want to do. And so, the um, you know, the rules have changed. Here, here's the thing, and this is the, this is the core of the alt-right. The core of the alt-right is understanding 
that the rules have changed and you have to play the game by the new rules. And so that's what the alt-right is going to do. We are going to apply all of these rules to Muslims, we're going to apply all of these rules to atheists, we're going to apply all of these rules to Jews, and that's how we're going to restore, hopefully peacefully, the homogenous nation and culture that we lost as a result of all this immigration nonsense and all this multiculturalism nonsense and all that sort of thing. The thing is, I mean, it's really kind of appalling. One of the, one of the Muslims was saying, well, where are we supposed to get, get the food that we, are, that we are willing to eat? Well, why don't you go back to your Muslim homelands? The same goes for the Jews. There's absolutely no right to co eat kosher food anywhere. You want kosher food? Go to Israel. There, there's, there's no... The, the, anyone... I mean, the, the thing is, you have to understand, these are the rules they demanded. These are the rules they wanted. So now everyone is going to play by that. And what we're seeing is that this resurgence of Western civilization, this resurgence of Western culture, is only beginning. Okay? And so the, the thing, is, you know, yes, um, you know, Le Pen lost yesterday. Um, you know, she only got, what, 34, 35 points? Doesn't matter. As, as, the, um, as the Sweden Democrats say, Europe belongs to us. And as that commenter said, the West is ours. People who are not Western, who do, are not part of Western civilization, are guests. You know, it's important to be hospitable. It's important to treat guests well. You know, I mean, you know, I, I have a... Um, I have some Jewish friends who are coming over in, in uh, next month, you know, I ask them, hey, uh, do you have any dietary requirements? Why? Because they're my friends. They're my guests. I want to be a good host, right? But here's the point. That's my choice. That is up to me. They do not have the right to come into my house and tell me, you cannot serve that. You cannot eat that, etc., etc. And the same rules that apply to a house apply to a nation. And the same rules that apply to a nation apply to the state, which is the homeland of that nation. And so, you know, this is not a anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim sentiment. This is an omni-national sentiment that if, when, when the, the situation is reversed, you know, when I lived in Japan, I went out of my way to try to do things the way that the Japanese do. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, I mean, yes, we know that, that some, you know, uh, the whole, you know, Holocaustianity and whining about anti-Semitism and so forth has been incredibly profitable to small numbers of, of Jews. The guy who runs the Southern Poverty Law Center, I think he's, he's, he's you know, turned shrieking about anti-Semitism into a $300 million a year, uh, you know, non-profit. <laughs> non-profit. Um, so, you know, there's a reason that, I mean, people behave, yeah, Morris Dees is his name. People behave in these, in these ways because there's incentive to do so. And so the correct way to handle the situation is make sure that they don't have any incentive to do it. Now, what was interesting to me is that, and, and how you can see things are changing, is that despite the fact that both the Muslims and the, uh, the Jews were you know, shrieking their outrage about it, the uh, parliament voted unanimously for this law. And, and this is yet another indication that people are, are, are fed up with the whole concept of uh, we need to respect the rights of the minority and make the, the majority suffer for it. And they're fed up with the idea that it's necessary for you know, people who were born seven decades 
after the events of World War II um, have to kowtow to the demands of people because of something bad that happened 70 years ago. It's absurd. It's over. It's history. It's done. There's, there's, there's absolutely no reason to pay any attention to it whatsoever. You know, we don't make, make our policy based on the killing fields in Cambodia. We don't make our policy based on what happened in Rwanda in the 1990s. We don't make our policy based on the um, Cultural Revolution in China. And we shouldn't make our, our policies based on anything that happened in Germany or Eastern Europe or anywhere else. It has nothing to do with us. And so, you know, I mean, if people want to, I, I mean, here's the thing. We're not going to permit Aztecs to go ahead and carve out the hearts of people and offer them to the sun because of religious freedom. We're not going to let people go and sacrifice goats to the devil in a cemetery because of religious freedom. And we're not going to let Muslims and Jews torture animals just because they think that that's part of their, they believe sincerely that that's part of their religious freedom. It doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's done. And if you want to whine about it, then go bake a freaking cake. Okay, because you're in exactly the same position as that as that baker. Actually, you're not even as good in a position as that baker, because at least that baker belongs in the West. If you practice Shinto, if you worship one of the many Hindu deities, etc., etc., you are not Western. Okay? Western civilization is not yours. It is not your tradition. And that's okay. You know, there's absolutely nothing wrong. You know, Chinese civilization for centuries put Western civilization in the dust. You know, um, I mean, as you know, I, I don't mind the, the, the combined products of uh, various civilizations. I have tremendous respect for Japanese civilization. Um, I prefer, I've, I've lived there. I prefer Western civilization. Um, does this concept apply to blacks and Native Americans? Yes, I think so too. You know, the past is the past. I think we still have an obligation to um, deal reasonably and humanely with people. I certainly, you know, as an American Indian myself, I would certainly be very loath to see um, to see the um, uh, Indian reservations taken away. I don't think that would be just, you know. Um, and it, but what we've seen, I and mean, what you need to keep in mind, is that um, only 400,000 Africans were brought over to the West as slaves. Okay? So um, the situation is very, very different now. You know, there are a lot of, there are a tremendous amount of evils in the past that have been committed by every people from every civilization of which I am aware. You know, it's possible that there was some peaceful tribe of Indians or something somewhere that were just, you know, gathering roots or something and never did anything to nobody, but, um, but I am not aware of it. And so, um, <laughs> it is a baby metal tee. Uh, Crypto Fashion does not sell baby metal tees. I'm just wearing it because I'm Kitsune. Um, but the, uh, you know, what people need to understand is that the um, because the, the the concept of religious freedom has been rejected, and because the situation which um, in which religious freedom applied no longer applies, um, you know nobody has any more right to practice you know to to any sort of to do something that is justified by religion any more than that Christian baker who uh, was sued and ended up having to, you know, I think they lost their business and everything else. Um, so that, that is my, you know, t I suggest that when people come to you and complain about various things relating to religious freedom and so forth, just let that be your, your reply. Let them bake cake. You know, it's effective rhetoric and it, it is an absolutely apt analogy. So, um, you know, Christians 
were the ones who invented the concept of religious freedom. If they don't get to, if they don't get religious freedom, nobody does. As for the Constitution, the Constitution is a dead letter. You know, this is something else that it's important to understand. The Constitution no longer applies. It's no longer relevant. Um, judges are simply inventing whatever it is that they want to invent. And so um, we are no longer morally or conceptually bound by the Constitution anymore. I was asked by someone, um, you know, well, what about the Constitutional Party? I said, well, given that the Constitution is irrelevant, the... Um, you know, there's no, there's no point in, in taking it seriously. And so that's both good and bad. It's bad because anyone can do anything that they want now. It's all a power game. It's all identity politics. But again, the reality is those, that's the reality. Okay? It doesn't matter, you know, it, trying, to, trying to play by the Constitution today is like playing in the NFL and refusing to throw the ball because you insist that the forward pass was illegal according to the rules back in you know in the 1920s or something, and so, um, so the, but but the good news is we're not limited anymore. The gloves are off. We don't just have to sit around and take the political punches and let people run around. You know, we're no longer in a boxing match with both hands tied behind our backs while the other guy has has you know cement blocks taped to his hands or something. Um, and so it's important for everybody to understand that there is the silver lining, that we are no longer conceptually or legally limited by any of the things that we were previously limited by before. And so, uh, you know, the sooner the God Emperor realizes this and stops trying to play by the non-existent rules, the more effective a president he's going to be. You know, and now, I mean, and the next generation of leaders is going to understand this. You know, I don't believe Marine Le Pen understood this. I know Donald Trump does not understand this. But those of you who are the next generation of political leaders, both in Europe and the United States, understand that and are beginning to apply it. I think we're also beginning to see that in Israel. If you look at what, ben, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu has been around for a while, but what did he do just this week? He, they basically, they passed a law, the Knesset passed a law saying that um, Israel is the Jewish homeland, full stop, period. And uh, the Arab language is no longer an official language in Israel. It's, you know, Hebrew is now the official language. And I think that those are positive, straight, you know, very positive, um, important measures because every nation needs a home. Um, no, it, I mean, Israel is, is fundamentally leftist. Um, you know, they, I mean, their whole, their roots are in, uh, are, are in the, definitely in the left. Um, however, they discovered out of necessity sooner than uh, the Russians and Eastern Europeans did that socialism just doesn't work. And so they're still essentially of the left, but they're of the realistic left. And then there is also um, a number of, of you know, um, with Zihut, um, Moshe Feiglin's party, um, they're pulling Netanyahu to the right. So, but, but the thing is, is that, so, so in that way, uh, you know, Israel is a, a strong example of a nation applying the laws of the state to the benefit of the people whose homeland it is. And that is what Donald Trump promised Americans in his uh, inaugural address, and hopefully he'll continue to apply it. That's what Europeans need to learn. Europeans are still a little bit caught up in, um, uh, Europeans are still a little bit caught up in their um, trans-Europeanism. And they're still caught up in the, in the multiculturalism. That's but, but in the case of Europe, it's largely been imposed from them from without. It's been imposed on them from the United States. And so it doesn't run quite as deep um, in that way. 
However, they are much more left-wing than the United States is, so that's a complicating factor. You know, but but the, the key thing is, every you know, read the 16 points of the alt-right. Every nation has a right to exist, has a right to exist in its homeland, and has a right to exist unadulterated by other peoples and by by immigrants and anyone else. Nobody has a right to impose themselves on a nation any more than anyone has a right to impose themselves in someone else's house. And so, you know, this is something that everybody understands intuitively to be true, but because the media and the educational authorities and the political elite are so caught up in, in their charade of, of pretending that the world is not the way that it is, you know, we're in this situation. And, you know, hopefully we can extricate it, extricate ourselves from it with a minimum of, of tragedy. I am not convinced that that's going to be possible, but the point is, is that finally, you know, finally, the trend is moving in a positive direction. And so, you know, the, the more that we, but the more that we understand that it is to everyone's benefit if Western civilization survives. It is to everyone's benefit if every nation has its own homeland to live in, then um, we will all benefit as a whole. That is for the greater good, even if it's not necessarily good for, you know, for me, you know, as a Christian, you know, I would not be a desirable immigrant in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, in a number of non-Christian countries. By the same token, in a Christian country, um, you know, people from other religions and cultures are not, ne are not necessarily a benefit and not necessarily desirable, and more importantly, have no right to be in, the, in those other national homelands. So, mutual respect for actual national diversity is for the common good. And for those who protest otherwise, again, I say, let them bake cake. So have a good afternoon. Um, and I hope to be back around again, uh, back around again tomorrow. Um, that's because this is actually daylight for once. So anyhow, um, have a good afternoon, have a good evening, and we'll speak to you soon.